Hey, it's Merce. Welcome back to my channel where I review horror books with a supernatural focus. In today's video, we're going to be doing a reading vlog and I don't exactly know what I want to read. I just been kind of thinking about it. Just not really sure what I'm in the mood for. So we're going to figure it out together and then just read some stuff, talk about it. Yeah, and just hang out on this very dreary day, which is my favorite days for reading in. So let's go ahead and jump into my library and see what I should read. I'm gonna be using my phone camera as a little second camera here so we can get in really close. So up here are my novellas and these are my Penny Dreadfuls. I have not read all of these yet. So I haven't read this one. Okay, so this is volume three. I read volume, volume one. I think this should be volume two. The beauteous, beauteous evil. Yes. Okay, so I want to read this one because I'm really just feeling this vibe right now. And I think I can just read this all one sitting. Just going to go ahead and put this on the stack. Okay, so here are my short story collections. I really wanted to read something from here that have a dark biotech theme to them. This came in, in a bomb roll box. And there is a story here by David Sodergren, but I think I want to kind of just choose one on the title. So usually with short story collections, I don't read them in order. And I know you probably should because the editor puts them in a specific order, but sometimes when I just want to read something short, I, I just want to read something I think that's going to be the theme that I'm looking for, which is usually something haunted. But let's just take a quick peek at the names of these stories. Born of a barbed wire womb. And that makes me think of Giger right off the bat. So I think that's calling my name. Do I feel like reading any vintage today? I don't think so. I am reading a John Saul book at the moment. I don't think there's anything in here I want to read. Now let's go up here to my hardcovers. So here are books that I've started and other um, reading things that I need to finish. Well, there is Black Lake Manor. I was curious about this. So let's add this as a possibility for today. Board Gay Werewolf. And also the whispering I've been thinking about. Maybe these two? I think this is going to be really funny. And then this one, the whispering, which is spooky. Okay, let's add it to the pile. Let's see if there's anything else. I can't see because all these overgrown leaves in here. I do have a Darcy Coates book, but I'm gonna save that. Um, save that. I did want to read um, Stephen King's The Gunslinger, but I don't think I want to do that today. I still need to read this one. And this one and this one. I did want to read The Ward. I'm not feeling Suzuki today. Oh man. Oh, I wish I would have took this with me on vacation. I forgot about it. Oh my god, it's so good. I am curious about a little hope. Be a good pick today. Getting a pretty good big pile here. I wonder what I'm gonna do. There's anything that I want to read right now that's down here. Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, there's definitely books here I want to read, like this one, this 362 Bell Isle Street like ghost story. I also want to read this Tanner's Dell. I mean, there's a lot of stuff here I want to read, but nothing really calling my name at the moment. <laughs> I think I'm just going to stick with this stack and it's a lot here so let's see what I can actually do today. I know that I can read this today. That's definitely a go. I know that I definitely want to check this one out and Bored Gay Werewolf. I do want to read this short story so it's just going to be I think between these two. I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to do this one. So I think this is a really good selection. Let's go ahead and get set up. Get ready to read. Um, I'm going to do 20 pages of the novels and I will probably finish Penny Dreadful and read the short story. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to go ahead and start with Penny Dreadful. I don't exactly remember what happened in volume one, but I know it was like a pretty big cliffhanger. And so maybe they'll remind me in the new issue. I really love the look and feel of these illustrations. Uh, they look so much like the characters from the show. So it's always just kind of like hanging out with old friends again. Okay, so I finished it. It is so exciting. And it makes you just want to go back and watch the whole entire series again. So many crazy things are happening in this, but we do get a backstory for Dorian Gray, like his origin story. It's a little one, but it was really cool because it's never really talked about. So that was really awesome to find out. And there's just so much action, so much blood and violence. I can't tell you too much about it because if you're going to read this, I don't want to spoil it for you. So I can't really actually say much about it. It was It's everything like the show, but just a little bit more bonkers because they can kind of just do whatever they want here. Um, and it's intense, you know, it, it's getting into epic levels. So yeah, so fun. <laughs> so exciting. Um, so damn good. So if you like Penny Dreadful the show, you definitely need to check it out. If you just like intense, messed up, end of days type things with a Victorian setting and a lot of your favorite horror characters thrown in, definitely gonna like this. I do have the third one. I think it is the conclusion of the the series unfortunately um so i'm gonna hold off on that one for a little bit now let's get to hex experiments the dark biotech anthology um the story that i'm going to be reading today is by keith anthony baird born of a barbed wire womb which is very intriguing and it starts off at the polish german border winter january 1943. So this is a story that takes place in World War II and it's taking place at this facility that's being run by the Nazis and it is a experimental facility where they're trying to reanimate dead soldiers. What could possibly go wrong? So that in itself is already pretty disturbing and it's really setting us up for like you know, <laughs> there's something bad's going to be happening. Something that they're trying to reanimate, reanimates and wreaks havoc on this facility. <laughs> there is a minor character in the story. It's a little girl who has been brought to the facility. And sometimes we switch to her and we get a little bit of her perspective of what it's like being there. It's definitely body horror. So if you like body horror and you like the World War II theme backdrop, you might really like this. Um, it's definitely gruesome and brutal and dark. The writing style, I didn't really love too much because it kind of just felt like reading a history book. And I always just find them to be dry, you know? Um, but then when we would talk about the little girl in the story, we would kind of switch to her and like what her perspective is and like what she's like experiencing while she's there. Uh, but I felt like the those two things kind of felt weird together. I don't know, maybe just the writing style. But I did really like this reanimated thing. It sounds terrifying. If you, I think it was kind of reminding me a little bit of like the thing, a little bit of like dead space, um, stuff like that. You know, so it's very disturbing. It was very cool. Um, I could see it very clearly in my mind, which I think is what made it really creepy and scary. So I really love the monster. If I had to give it a rating, I don't know, I, I'd say like three out of five for me. Girls of Little Hope is about three girls who went into the woods and only to return, but they were covered in blood with no memory of what happened. They're 15 and they live in a really uneventful town called Little Hope in California. And this takes place in 1996. Donna, Ray, and Kat are really close teen friends. They sort of do everything together. They do creative things like zine making, but they're also into amateur sleuthing which is what leads them to this lost gold mine and wanting to figure out why Ronnie Gaskins burned his parents alive a decade ago. This is my little reading buddy, Charmander. <laughs> it's like the, it's just like the perfect shape to sit on your lap and hold a book so that your wrists don't get tired. Oh, I love, I love this stuffed animal so much. This is uh, gonna be a good read. I think. And what I like about it so far is it really encapsulates that lonely, forgotten by the world feeling that you can have when you grow up in a little know-nothing town. 
you know, where you just feel like everybody comes there to die or, <laughs> you know, they just, it's just a place that's going nowhere and has nothing to offer. And the only thing that you might actually find there are in your friendships or with your family, you know, depending. So there are three girls here, Donna, Ray, and um, Kat. Donna, Ray, and Kat. And this starts out with Donna and Ray ending up at the police station, or not actually the police station, um, the hospital, because they have to be scoured for forensics. They somehow emerge from the woods naked and dirty without their friend Kat. But uh, the issue is that these two girls, Donna and Ray, they actually can't verbalize. They are not able to talk about what happened, where they were, where's Kat, nothing. And they're both acting really weird. Like Ray, I think it's Ray, she's like smiling and it's really strange. We get to meet Kat's mother who is just completely insane with concern and anger about why you know, these two girls are back, but her daughter's not. And we come to find out that the reason that she's angry is not just because where's, <laughs> where's my daughter, um, it's because that she contacted the police hours and hours and hours before these two girls emerged from the woods saying, my daughter is missing. We've heard this story before. If you watch a lot of true crime, she's a teenager. She probably ran away to do teenage stuff. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so she's pissed, rightfully so. The police are now at Kat's house and they're going through her bedroom collecting, you know, whatever they can collect there. Her bed sheets, uh, anything that might point in a direction of where she may have went. And they do end up finding some cigarettes, <laughs> like in a hollowed out book, some cigarettes and a pregnancy test, along with a small scrap of paper that looks like Maybe it could be drugs of some sort, no idea, but it has like a pentagram on it. And the mom is like, ooh, you know, I really thought I knew my daughter. I thought she knew who she was. She was such a good kid. Even though at the same time, knowing one thing that we know about the mom, which was that she was feeding her kid diet pills without her child's consent. She didn't know, you know, and she's, a, she's 16 years old. and Her mom thinks that she's doing her a favor you know, which is actually extremely messed up. So we can already tell that their relationship is weird and there's obviously a lot of issue there. So of course the cops are like, <laughs> yeah, of course she's running away, right? Um, so then we actually get to read a few pages of Kat's diary and she, this kind of gives us a little bit of background on her and Ray and uh, Donna, how they're best friends, how they came to meet, how they kind of complete each other and how they're sort of like the the last hope for each other in this empty town you know this nowhere town and uh, how they're you know they're all hoping that they can leave this place and become the things that they want to become and they're gonna do it because it's the 90s and girl power and, and you know they're they're just they're really looking to the future with this real brightness so that's as far as I got. Um, it it it's really good. I'm was kind of really just brought into it right away. From the synopsis, I do know that there's a mine, and so I'm assuming that maybe this mine has something to do with it. It also has historical meaning to the town. Like that's how the town was like established. It was during a gold rush of some sorts, like sort of like San Francisco. This has a very exciting crime mystery vibe and yeah, and I'm just really impressed with how they were able to really portray the small town vibe because it's a very particular feeling. It's, I remember being like 14, you know, 13 years old and just feeling like the rest of the world was leaving me behind, you know, and that's kind of what they talk about here. Board Gay Werewolf by Tony Santarella. The cover explains a story to be kind of like Scooby-Doo with Grinder or Stranger Things with Sex and Ennui. <laughs> Also, a really healthy dose of capitalism and werewolves and other things going on. So I'm really curious to see what this story is about. So we get to meet Brian, who seems to be a little bit of a hot mess. We get to see his apartment, which is a very good reflection of him, I think. Uh, it's very messy in there. He ha even has like boxes that are not unpacked yet because he doesn't even want to do it because he feels like, why unpack these boxes? I might have to leave at any moment because he's a werewolf. So he 
is kind of just like in this state of mind where he's kind of living day to day, I guess you could say. He is a college dropout. He was staying with his parents briefly, um, but his parents really didn't know how to handle this whole werewolf situation. They were just dealing with him coming out. Um, and now that along with the werewolf transition, I guess, is they have no idea what to do with it. So he was like, it's fine. I'm going to go out on my own. So he doesn't really have a strong support system besides his two friends, Nick and Darby, who he works with um, at the restaurant that he waiters at. So after we meet Nick in his apartment and he's like hungover and you know, he gets ready, he goes to work. And when he gets to work, he sees that there is a newspaper on the cafe table somewhere. And it's a really big story on the front page. And it's talking about that another person has been attacked by some kind of animal this month. And so his wheels are already turning and he's like, is it me? Am I the problem? You know? Um, so that's kind of like where we're at with it. I think this is going to be, this kind of feels more like maybe like a coming of age thing, even though I think Brian's already 26, but kind of like this transition because he's just become like a, a of a werewolf like a year before so he's still kind of like trying to figure it all out it has a feeling that's going to be this kind of like funny tongue-in-cheek kind of like uh, i don't know what you call those kind of stories you know where it's like it's kind of like regular life right like your regular life challenges like romantic relationships and friends and your job and trying to make things work and um, you know, maybe there is a challenge that you have in your life, you know, that is something that you really have to work around, but with this werewolf theme to it. So I think it's pretty funny. I don't really know if it's something that I will read, though, because it's not it's not really horror. So it seems like it's going to be probably pretty cute is what I would say. Sarah Rain, The Whispering. This is a supernatural ghost story that takes place in a remote Belgian convent. And it's kind of like your traditional ghost story in the sense that someone's haunting the place and um, the main character has to figure out what's going on. Um, but I like there's there's this connection with World War One, I, I think, and this uh, Belgium convent and also with a Palestrina choir, which is really interesting. OK, so this is definitely right up my alley. This is very spooky. It has ghosts, it has an old mansion, there's a beautiful old library inside of it. Um, so we get to meet Michael. He is an author. He is traveling to this old mansion called the Fossa House. And it is, uh, there's only uh, one person who lives there. It's this old lady in her 70s. And she has some documents and stuff for him to look over for his book, which he's going to be writing about poetry of the Great War, the First World War. And so he's very excited and keen to get to that information. So when he arrives there, it's like gloomy and rainy and just kind of dark, you know, it's kind of foreboding. It has a bit of a gloomy feeling. And when he gets out of his car and he goes up to the house, he sees this young man. And what sticks out to him about this man is that he has this, what he calls a kind of like a leaf shaped scar on his cheek and this man is like saying something very weird he's saying something to the effect of don't make me go back there i'll go insane something like that he's just like okay sure so he gets to the house he meets the woman and she's very much the part of a old lady who would be in a mansion she has a sense of privilege you know she kind of carries herself in that manner but he ends up actually getting stuck there the storm has become so strong that a tree has been felled right over the road where he would be leaving the house, right? Because if you can imagine, it's like one of those houses where like there's a gate and you go up, right? So of course, right outside the gate, he can't get out now. And so darn it, he's gonna have to stay, which okay, which for him is like fine because there is this old library and it's like everything you want, right? It's musty, it's dusty, it's full of books. It has chairs by a fireplace. He's, he's just like, it's fine that I'm stuck here. You know? On a table in the library, there is a little box. And in this box is a bunch of stuff. It's like letters and whatever. And he starts reading one of the letters. And there's something in there that reminds him of the man from outside. Because it's kind of using the same line. You know, don't let me go into madness. So he's kind of starting to think like, 
this is weird. He's definitely aware that he gets kind of souped up into his own imagination. Like, I do that too, right? Like, I'm always looking to connect things with stories. So when I find a connection, I get real excited and then I have to be like... So it's a little endearing. Like, he he's, he's very open to what this house is telling him, even though he's trying to keep cool. So he ends up looking at the rest of the house uh, and he notices there's a photo in one of the hallways. It's not a photo. It's a drawing. It's a drawing that somebody did in like 1917, 1918, around there. He thinks, wow, this is so weird. Like one of these characters in this illustration remind me of the man that I met outside of the building. So this is purposely being built as like a very familiar like mansion style type thing. Even the way like the the older woman character opens the door, you know, she's like, hi, I'm expecting you, you know? So you, you see these like nods to that and you know, the tree blocking the ways on a stormy night. So now you can't leave. I mean, it's just, it's really, really perfect. And it's pretty good. It is a little dry, but it's um, it's not bad. There are a, little, a lot of letters to read. I think I've already read like four, four or five. We did touch upon the, the choir and apparently this old woman is very important to this book because she is a relative of one of the people in the choir. And so this choir, like they did something, but something big happened, something big and something weird. It's pretty intriguing. There is a cat in here that's mentioned and its name is Wilberforce, which I think is a, an amazing name, by the way. So I think this is going to be a nerdy, spooky read, you know, where you have like a lot of history kind of playing in as the background for the mystery and the spookiness of everything that's going on. I'm happy. It's everything I like in a haunted house, as you know, so I'm stoked about it. About it. So that was the reading vlog. Thank you so much for hanging out with me tonight. I really do appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Be sure to take care of yourselves, look out for each other, and I will talk to you next time.